Our next speaker is Preston Singletary. And uh, he is someone's art that I've admired. His art is featured in the Seattle Art Museum. And whenever I've walked into the Seattle Art Museum, like his art leaves me speechless. It is so incredibly gorgeous and beautiful. And uh, I have fangirled over his art for a long time. So I was like, oh my gosh, I get to introduce Preston Singletary. <laughs> and kind of emailed him out of the blue, and I was like, this isn't gonna work. And I'm, kind of, I'm still kind of surprised it worked. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna introduce you. Um, could we? Yeah. All right, so. Uh, I'm going to read this from your bio. So, when Preston began working with Glass in 1982, he had no idea that he'd be so connected to the material in the way that he is. It was only when he began to experiment with using designs from his Clinket cultural heritage that his work began to take on a new purpose and direction. Over time, his skill with the material of glass and traditional form line design has strengthened and evolved allowing him to explore more fully his own relationship to both his culture and chosen medium. This evolution and subsequent commercial success has positioned him as an influence on contemporary indigenous art. Through teaching and collaborating in glass with other Native American, Maori, Hawaiian, and Australian Aboriginal artists, he's come to see that glass brings another dimension to indigenous art. The, artist, the artistic perspective of indigenous people reflects a unique and vital visual language which has connections to the ancient codes and symbols of the land, and this interaction has informed and inspired his own work. His work with glass transforms the notion that native artists are only best when traditional materials are used. It has helped advocate on the behalf of all indigenous people, affirming that we are still here that we're declaring who we are through our art and connection to our culture. His work continues to evolve and connect uh, his personal cultural perspective to current modern art movements, and he has received much attention for striving to keep the work fresh and relevant. We are very excited and honored to have you join us, and I love having another fellow Alaskan join us for this day. So, welcome, Preston. This is a better mic? Yeah, much better. <laughs> well, it was a brief introduction in Clinkett. Uh, very few words that I actually know. I'm not from the Salish region, but my family actually comes from Sitka. So I am honored to be here on the land of the Salish and to, to learn uh, through this last presentation a little bit about the region. and um, <clears throat> So yes, we're from the north, uh, but I grew up in Seattle. Um, this is a presentation which is quite robust. Uh, I'll share as much as I can. I might run out of time, but that's okay. Uh, I always feel compared to share, share a lot of information about uh, the journey um, that I took to become, well, to, to do what I do today. And so I grew up in Seattle. Uh, this is some of my traditional regalia with my son who was young, uh, younger. He's 22 now, so. Anyway, that's what we look like with our traditional, uh, some of our design work and the button blankets. This is actually my wife. Um, she comes from Sweden, so she comes from the other side of the world, the same latitude as uh, Sitka, Alaska, but over in Stockholm, Sweden. Um, this was my father, so I'm quite, you know, mixed uh, in my uh, cultural background, so he's non-native, he was, uh, uh, you know, mixed European. Uh, but this was his passion, he was a very famous fly fisherman in the, in the Northwest, and he also dabbled in lots of things, uh, like creative things. He was very well book-read, he was a great outdoorsman, he was 
uh, dabbled in soapstone carving and painting, and he wrote poetry and did calligraphy and all kinds of things. Between him and my mother, who was also a musician, played Delta Blues, and she did a lot of handicrafts. You know, basically, I was raised in a, a creative family. Um, and so um, I guess it kind of wore off on me. My, um, uh, uh, I'm going to be jumping around quite a bit, so you're going to have to uh, follow me through this, but it'll make sense in the end. This was the um, uh, May 18th, 1980, which I always say fostered my career as a glass artist because some of the people, uh, what they, uh, some artists took the ash from the glass and they melted it to create uh, glass that they would make glass art out of. But at that time, music was my main passion all through high school. In fact, I went to school, I didn't go to college. I went, um, fell straight into glass blowing, but thinking that music was gonna be my, my uh, like I wanted to check the box, you know, uh, rock star, working musician, you know, in the job uh, application, but um, so I've always been playing music, and I also will talk a little bit about that later. But this is uh, the fellow that got me into glass blowing. This is my friend Dante Marioni. Um, here we are standing with uh, uh, an Italian glass mas master glass blower, and so we had the good fortune of befriending him and watching him and studying with him and assisting, uh, and we picked up a lot of of great. Um, you know, ways of working. The Italian process is quite um, refined and they're you know, considered some of the best glass blowers in the world. So we, we really had a great time working um, uh, around him. But this was the main team that I worked with. This was a studio of Benjamin Moore. And so, as I mentioned, you know, a year after high school, age 19, I slipped into uh, glass uh, blowing in a factory and making Christmas balls, paperweights. Then I started to go to Pilchuck Glass School north of Seattle, and that's where I learned about how artists work with glass. And this man here, Benjamin Moore, was the artistic director of Pilchuck, and he ran this studio. It was a very highly, it was a very specialized studio that um, we made uh, work for lots of different people. Um, the one thing I have to say about glass blowing is it's, a, it's, it's such a team effort. It's a real amazing process. I mean, everybody's really working together to make larger and more complex pieces. You must work in a team. Minimum amount of people that I work with is always two, but sometimes I have like five, four or five people helping me in the studio. So here we're down in Tacoma uh, at the Museum of Glass. And, um, and so, this whole time, you know, being a glass blower and working and training and uh, with learning from other people and going to Pilchuck School, I was looking for the Clinkett Way. This was the street sign up in Sitka. Um, and this is my great grandmother who, um, in the center, she was um, the one that grew up in Sitka at the turn of the century. She was born late 1800s. and. She moved to Seattle in the 20s and took, she was widowed um, in 1919 um, and she had five children and then moved to Seattle with uh, uh, a man um, right here, pictured here. This is Dionisio Gubatayo. He's a Filipino man who traveled to Alaska and um, uh, worked for the canneries and the fisheries. Um, and they fell in love, got married, had some more kids, moved to Seattle. And that's what I, who I knew as my great grandmother. So jumping into a little bit, I've tried to kind of structure this. I'm still working with the flow of the story because I'm preparing for my a potential TED talk. <laughs> so I'm gonna be able to strut around and without my visual aids here. Um, but so I've tried to equate the idea of Raven in the Box of Daylight with the story of my career. And so that's how I'm kind of paralleling it. This is an exhibition that I put, uh, put together at the Tacoma Museum of Glass. Um, 
and it's traveled, it's traveling, it's currently at the National Museum of the American Indian, Indian the Smithsonian Institution. So this is um, Raven in the Box of Daylight, so this is basically Raven in the beginning of time, and Raven is a white bird, and so he uh, is, is looking for the daylight, um, and he goes to this old man, uh, or he goes to the fisherman of the night first, and he asks, where's the daylight? Uh, and this old man, they're told of this old man who lives at the head of the Nas River, and so he goes to the, um, so this is the, the fisherman of the night scene here, um, and he goes to the old man and says, you know, can I come inside your clan house? And the old man shoes him away, you know, he, presumably he has lots of treasures inside of his clan house. But he also learned about a, a, his, uh, the old man's daughter who is transparent. So um, there's a lot of symbolism inside this story and the, the transparent or the white bird. Uh, uh, usually white animals in native culture are thought of as being special or having some kind of sp you know, uh, spirit significance to it. And, and the same with this uh, daughter who is transparent. I don't know why she was transparent. Uh, oh, so now we're switching to some of the early work that I did in the sort of the foundation of the things, uh, you know, learning to be a glass blower, learning how to control the material. These were the earliest things that I did to kind of develop uh, my skills. And these pieces are kind of large, uh, you know, for blown glass, but these were what I was making based on the people that I worked with and worked around. Um, and then one day I said, okay, I want to I wanna explore this native side of, you know, this clinket um, design work. And so I started to work on these pieces, um, and it's an upside down cedar hat form, you know, so you turn it upside down, it becomes a bowl. I discovered these, um, these uh, shadows just purely by accident. Um, one day, my aunt came to a holiday open house at Benjamin Moore's studio, and, and she knew that I was getting into this design work, and she said, can we put the hat on this nice pedestal with the beautiful light and all this? Usually, the assistants, we have a little card table over in the corner, and so I said, sure. So we you know, put the, the hat out, and about 10 people followed her, you know, to see what was going to happen, and they saw the shadows, and everybody was like, oh, look at that. And it's like, well, yeah, that's what I intended all along, you know? Of course, that was like the eureka moment. I kind of felt like, you know, okay, there's something here that I need to kind of follow this thread. Um, and kind of a little bit about part of what brought me around to this was, you know, this kind of notion of spirituality. I wasn't raised with any religious instruction, so this was something that, um, when I read this Carlos Castaneda books, they were very popular in the 80s, and there was something that, um, kind of alluded to some kind of spirituality and this kind of ability to navigate within your dream time. And it was quite fascinating, even though it's been, a lot of it has been debunked because, um, you know, it, may, it might have been falsified, but there was also some degree of, you know, inspiration in those books that I found fascinating. And because that led me, you know, since I didn't go to college, I, w I started to, you know, seek out things, um, art and philosophy. You know, the Joseph Campbell was a natural one because he talked about the power of myth, talked about symbolism, and that's what I'm getting into with this Raven story, and we'll get back to that in a minute. But um, this is kind of the, this is what led me to start to think about these things in different ways. This is, you know, his, um, uh, Joseph Campbell's uh, kind of archetype of the mythology in general, uh, about the hero's journey, about, um, you can see it common in pretty much every movie. You know, you might look at Star Wars and say, okay, Luke Skywalker was, you know, his parents were killed, he was thrown into this situation, and he has to, 
he has to struggle and fight and he finds Obi-Wan Kenobi and then that's his mentor and then he learns and he emerges on the other side, you know, victorious and, and, and or you could say it's the same thing with the Wizard of Oz. I mean, Dorothy is thrown into this, you know, into this world and she has to follow this path and all of a sudden she learns things along the way, she finds her helpers and all these things. And so, um, this is, you know, if you break it down into almost every story, you can find these, uh, these symbols or these um, archetypes. And so, in a way, it was kind of like my own, my own hero's journey, <laughs> if I want to call myself a hero. But this was the, uh, the call to adventure. So this, when, I, when I started coming up with my career, I had an opportunity to work at the Pilchuck Glass School, which is where I had been attending for several years, we, we um, um, it's only a, uh, a workshop in the summer. It's, it's a very short workshop, and there's like five or six of them um, uh, sessions, and there's five classes to every session. Anyway, so we decided to, um, we pitched the idea to make a, a totem pole for the founders of the Pilchuck Glass School. And so this is David Svensson. This was one of my first mentors, and he was um, lived up in Alaska. He was a, a very skilled carver, or he is. He's still, we still kind of uh, work together a little bit. But he designed this totem pole with some folks up in Haines, Alaska. And so we wanted to make this tribute to the Pilchuck School at their 30th anniversary, and it was John Hauberg who was the heir to Weyerhaeuser, so a cedar monument seemed like really appropriate to, um, to represent him, um, and, and as well, he had this, this dagger here that we were, um, that was owned by a, um, a family up in Angoon, and so uh, he repatriated it to them, and most of John Hauberg's collection is in the Seattle Art Museum, and it's quite spectacular, really, really beautiful collection. So he was celebrated by the Native community. He was given the Clinket name for giving this, this dagger back to um, the Jacob family in Angoon, and was given a Clinket name. So that's where we saw it befitting to, to make this, um, uh, tell this story, because by tradition, uh, totem poles tell a story. So here we're working together um, at right by the glass studio. So there's a lot of you know kind of cool uh, energy going back and forth. And uh, the carvers from Alaska came down and they worked with glass. And here's a class that we created, um, kind of helping the uh, the finishing of the totem pole. And this is actually the only thing that I really contributed to it, other than helping drive the project. I didn't carve it, but I made this hat. And so everybody was kind of enamored. Well, when's the hat going to get done? When's it gonna, how's it going? And so the car was like, well, next time you need a hat stand, let me know. Um, because uh, anyway, so this was, this was like for me a rite of passage, you know, being at the, at the school where I learned and I kind of discovered myself as an artist. And, um, you know, working with these master carvers from Alaska was amazing. Um, some details of the of the pole here. This this represents Dale Chihuly's fa uh, face. Th this mask, and you know that Dale Chihuly has you know only one eye, so he has a patch. So we didn't represent it literally, but we gave this glass slash, which sort of like Chihuly had this vision of glass, um, and he's holding onto the the wings of the raven with the sun, you know, bringing like the, the idea of him bringing Pilchuck to the world, the, the, into the world. So this is, represents John Halberg with this dagger that he had repatriated. We had elders coming down from Haines, Alaska to help with the installation ceremony. So it was really an amazing uh, moment. And, you know, at the time it felt like all the stars were aligned. And I have to mention too, I mean, this was days before September 11th. This was like, so at that time, we were like on this absolute high, only, you know, a couple weeks later, feeling like, wow, what's happening in the world? But this, this um, moment for me was, um, was amazing, and it kind of put me on the map, so to speak, um, in many different ways. This, this is, you know, some, if I 
failed to mention, we, we actually, David Spenson is a, a neon artist too, so we hollowed through the, the, the totem and we backlit it with neon, so with multicolored tubes. So it's like an abalone inlay that is illuminated at, at night, so it's quite spectacular, these pieces. And so it's, it's been 21 years now and it's still standing. We just actually gave it a fresh coat of paint. So the bottom figure is, is John Halberg. Then you've got Dale Chihuly with the raven uh, with the sun in his beak. And then you've got Annie Halberg on top who is a patron of the arts. So um, as I'm getting into this whole process, you know, from from Carlos Castaneda to Carl Jung, I was I was interested and fascinated with dream dream analysis because Jung actually had done a lot of studies around the Native American vision quest and anal analysis of dreams, and so this was something that was really really difficult to to follow, you know, his reading. So I read some layman's books about you know, this whole idea of this psychology. So that kind of ties into my work, along with Aikido, which is a uh, martial art that I studied for several years, but it was, um, so all of these things coming together is what really kind of informs my perspective on this. The, um, and like the Aikido has a lot of roots in Zen Buddhism, and it's often, our instructor always referred to it as a moving meditation. And, but for me, this was the fascinating part. What really clicked for me was the idea that as, as you're grappling with somebody and somebody comes at you, it's this force and you have to learn how to turn it and, and, and deflect it. But when you're working with glass, you're also moving and manipulating your body and you're turning this pipe and it's the same kind of feeling I had around that. So it became like this kind of universal physical thing that was, that was the connection that I had with it. Um, and so that was quite fascinating to learn, to find these correlations and these connections through all of these things. So all, all of the, um, uh, I mean, working with the glass on a large scale too, it's quite heavy. So you're, you're really kind of using your whole body to move everything. So this is Joe David. This was my mentor or my helper in the in the archetype of the Joseph Campbell um, hero myth. And so he was a guy that uh, introduced me to the Sweat Lodge in uh, the summer of 2000. Now this was the year before we did the totem pole. So we went up to Pilchuck Glass School. We started doing sweat lodges up there, and he was you know he was uh, you know it was it. You know, he's a very standoffish guy, you know, and finally I convinced him we have to make some plans, you know, this coming up here, we're going to be on the campus, we have to do this, you know, we're going to play around with glass and I get to help you. And he said, well, I want to build a sweat lodge up there. And I said, well, okay, well, I don't know, because it's built on a tree farm, actually, uh, the school. And so, uh, but we got permission to do it. And he told everybody it's going to be a suffering and sacrifice ceremony. And those who want, to, who want to know about the ceremony, come and talk to him. And by looking in their eyes, you know, he would let you know, tell you what you needed to know. And, and then he would let you know if you're ready to, to do the ceremony. And I'd never done one, and I was kind of getting a little nervous about it. And I said, and finally, we were, you know, we were building the, the sweat lodge, and I said, Joe, look, come look into my eyes, you know, tell me, am I ready to do this? And he goes, well, let me put it this way. He says, you better be. <laughs> and I said, okay. <laughs> um, you know, I said, he goes, you know, hey, Press, you're my number one guy. And so I said, uh, okay, okay. So in four days' time, we did, or 11 days' time, we did four ceremonies. And after that cer final ceremony, he, had, he shared his name with me, which is something that used to happen, or it still happens, on the Northwest Coast, uh, where you assume new names if you maybe are growing as a person or you grow into being, becoming a, a, a house leader, for instance. You might assume an ancestral name or something like that. So Kakawan Chief was a name that is known on the coast. It's from the Nuchanulf. Um, uh, 
tribe, west coast of Vancouver Island. So, um, moving on, when I'm starting to think about this Raven show, back to the, the Raven show, um, uh, I was working with this man, Walter Porter, who is, um, I call him the, the clink at Joseph Campbell. He, he kind of shared with me these perspectives on the story. And um, so back to the story. Uh, actually, we were going to work on this exhibition together, but then he passed away before we could actually realize it. So I had uh, looked for another uh, curator. Her name was Miranda Bellardi Lewis, and she's actually university uh, professor at University of Washington, and she is a curator and a writer and uh, a, doc a doctor of uh, native sciences. So. Um, so Raven, back to the Raven story, Raven um, asked to come into the clan house. He's denied access to the clan house. Um, and so he, Raven has transformational uh, capabilities. So he, tra he changes himself into a speck of dirt and he floats down this natural spring where the daughter you know, goes out uh, with a ladle and she scoops up the water, but because she's of a high status in the family, or her, her whole family is of high status, she has, um, she has attendants to her, with her. So they take this feather and they draw the, you know, this feather through the water, and they see this little speck of dirt, if you can see, anyway, this little clear droplet, which is supposed to represent water, and then there's a little speck of dirt inside. So they cast out the water. And so Raven then has to reformulate his plan, and this time he changes himself into a hemlock needle. So this is Raven kind of in this mobile that's kind of moving, illustrating the idea that Raven's transforming into this hemlock needle. So this time she scoops up the water, she swallows, she doesn't see it, the, the needle, because it blends in with the, the ladle, so she swallows it. Now Raven's inside of her, and, and so she, he transforms inside of her belly into a human child. So this is the idea of Raven inside this pregnant woman. And in the old days, there was, they would dig a pit out behind the, the clan house, and they would line it with furs. And she's having trouble giving birth. You know, the child doesn't want to be burnt, born on these, these fine furs. So this medicine woman comes and says, take the furs away and replace it with, with moss. And so, uh, so he, so when they do that, then the child is born easily. And so this child comes out, uh, is born. This is a piece that is kind of animated. This is supposed to animate or, you know, create the idea that Raven is transforming now and still a little bit of, you know, uh, Raven detail there. But this is how he gets into the clan house. Okay. So now he's in the clan house. Um, so a little bit jumping back into my, uh, my studio practice, my accomplishments are not my own, but those of many. Um, partly that's, you know, all the, these are all the folks that helped me in my studio to execute my work uh, to varying degrees. Um, and yet the Maori proverb, I think, talks about this ancestral lineage. There are people that developed the art form that I practice in this new material, in this new medium. And there were people that would come after me, so I'm just like in between this, um, this ancestral sort of lineage and continuation. Um, a few of the objects that I've made, and some of these range from being traditional objects that I try to replicate in glass. Um, and so a lot of exploration about uh, form and then trying to transform the, uh, the, the uh, design work to the glass. And that's all done in a sandblasting process. So after the glass is formed, then I'll do the, uh, the carving, carving away the black to expose the, the red in this case. So it's carving through layers of color to create the contrast. This is sort of an homage to basketry um, and these forms, these rattles are inspired by traditional rattles that would be probably shaman rattles that were used for healing ceremonies. Um, 
masks and uh, kind of exploring this whole realm of, of, of trying to make it look like the actual traditional form. These spoons are trying every trip to make uh, every curve and, and integrate that design in such a way. So <clears throat> inside the clan house now, so Raven is inside the clan house and he's looking around at all these treasures. These are the objects that are owned by the old man. This is called what we call Atu, which is a, it's kind of an heirloom that's passed on through generations and kept together uh, by the house. We had the same system of potlatching we were talking about from the previous presenters. We were you know, that was the way to elevate your status within the community uh, was to, uh, but in this, this old man was hoarding these objects in his clan house, and so Raven is, uh, is now this boy in, in child form, and he's, always he's kind of precocious and mischievous, so he's always rooting around and trying to find stuff, and he comes upon this box. This is the box that contains the, um, the stars, and so he starts to play with the box. He starts to you know, um, and when no one's looking, he, he takes the star, he opens it, he takes the stars, and he throws it through the smoke hole in the clan house into the night sky. And so, you know, everybody's like, wow, could you do that? Why, why would you do that? Um, he's, so he's scolded, reprimanded, he was, you know, punished, and uh, after a couple of days, they kind of forget about it, and so he's found this next box, and this next box contains the moon. Um, and so again, he's kind of playing with it, and he's moving around and sitting on it and eating his food off it. And, and then finally, when no one's looking, he opens it up, and he takes the moon, and he tosses it through the smoke hole. And this time, the old man's pretty disappointed with him, you know, and says, you know, you've, you know, gosh, you know, this, this, isn't, this is no good. You're not, you're not uh, following my my uh, instructions here. And so he, um, so when Raven finds the, the third box, the box that contains the sun, the old man's like, no, nope, no way. Can't have that one. Um, so he, Raven starts to fuss and cry and, you know, he refuses to eat and he's carrying on for days and days and driving everybody crazy. And, and finally, you know, the daughter comes up to the, the father and says, is there anything more important than your grandson? And he says, no, of course you're right. So he takes the, bo the box and he kind of half wonders what's going to happen. Raven transforms himself back into a bird. He takes the sun and then the old man immediately uh, realizes that he's been duped. And so he grabs on to the tail of Raven. He grabs his tail and he holds them o over the, the smoke hole and he instructs the man to throw pitch on the, on the, on the fire. And so he, he, um, he then um, he f takes off with the sun and he flies through the smoke hole, but he's turned black at this point. So that's how Raven became black. And so with the, with the breaking of the daylight, then the, the people who were living in the darkness their whole life finally get to see what's around them. And some of them are startled and some of them run off into the forest, and they become the forest animals, and some of them jump into the water and they become the sea life, and some of them jump into the sky and they become the birds. And the people that either stood up like bewildered or some people say, they stood up strong and proud and it became the human beings, or they were too bewildered and don't, didn't know what to do. So that's, you know, kind of sums up mankind. And in, uh, in a lot of ways, um, so the the people that stayed where they were, and and they they became the clinket, the human beings, and then they started to adopt these animal symbols for the um, their family crests, and so all of these objects are adorned with the 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 animal symbols from the different realms. And so, you know, the metaphors of the Raven story, in a nutshell, is like, out of, you know, the world is in darkness, and, and uh, Walter used to love use, to use theology. He would say, you know, the Bible reference. He would say, Jesus is the light. And so, you know, coming out of the darkness into the light. And 
You know, also kind of talking about the idea of myth. The word myth means something that's untrue, uh, that has a two, two meanings. It can mean uh, it's, a, it's an ancient mythology, but it's also say, people who say, oh, that's a myth. That's not true. So we have this problem of sort of fighting our way outside, you know, or past this, this terminology that we use for our uh, ancient stories. Um, you know, uh, Joseph Campbell talked about how important storytelling is, and Walter also unlocked several different story uh, symbolisms within the stories and shared them with me, which he asked me to continue to share as broadly as I can. Um, the process of imaging um, was something that, you know, when you're hearing these stories, I rely on all these visual aids to, sh to, to get my point across, but Walter was really, really good about talking about holding people's uh, attention, but without any, without any pictures. I need my pictures. Uh, but so he, he said that in the old days at the potlatches, you know, would be listening to these stories over and over and over and over. And it's the same thing as if, you know, if our, our kids or well, growing up, we found this, this movie that we really liked. I mean, what would we do? We would watch it over and over and over because it was telling us this story. We're getting it kind of down in our heads. Well, in the old days, we didn't have the visuals, and so that the elders had this, they had this, that's where all the imagination comes from for these objects, you know. They had, they had this process, this imaging power in their brains that didn't require a lot of moving pictures. Um, so you, people start to think in pictures, and, you know, it, it's, making art is a very uh, meditative kind of process, and so, when you do that, you know, you spend a lot of time with, you know, doing something, it becomes, uh, you know, then you get, you unlock the creativity in your own imagination. <clears throat> so light is a metaphor, you know, it, we've, it's very universal. And so you start to look at these stories and you can see, you can start to un imagine the symbolism behind it. You know, uh, you know, we asked our teacher to shed light on a subject, or, you know, in the old days, this is probably too old for you guys, but they're comic books. There was a character who would get an idea, and a, a light bulb would pop on, or on top of their head. Um, and um, getting back into, like, the, the daughter that is transparent, and I already mentioned that she's a supernatural being, it signifies a, a, a spiritual being, and the whole idea that she gives birth uh, to this child, that's like the immac Immaculate Conception myth. Um, and and some, sometimes people get upset when I use that and say, we have the same stories, you know, we have the same, it's right there, I mean, how can you deny it? And they said, well, you know, um, Walter would say, you know, I, 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 just don't want, I just don't want people to think they can hog Jesus all to themselves. I, you know, so we're going to use that because everybody understands it. So, and it's not unique to the Bible. It's every mode of spirituality has some kind of origin of a virgin birth. So it's really something that we should understand on a much deeper level. Um, I talked about the... The, the birth and how she was having a hard time giving birth. And so the idea that it was to take the fine furs out and replace it with the moss, that was like, uh, symbolizes a virgin, or I mean, I'm sorry, a humble birth. A humble birth, like, again, the, the Jesus metaphor. So anyways, there's, there's a lot of, there, there's all kinds of metaphors and teachings within this, you know, you're, talk, you're teaching forgiveness, you're t there, there's stories about the cycle of revenge, there's stories of, of uh, you know, other um, kind of uh, cautionary tales about the cannibal giant, they're, they're, they're just keep, they're, there's so much um, in here, and as I mentioned, I have a lot of a lot of stuff here to um, to share, so I'm just going to kind of blast through these a little bit. 
Um, you know, the, the metaphor of the sun and the moon and the stars, you know, the stars give us direction and guidance, something that we look up to the stars, we worship movie stars, we think, you know, these, these are very simple uh, trigger words that we understand and we can use. Um, you know, the moon is not illuminated by itself, it's the sun is reflecting upon the moon, so the idea that there's this higher power somewhere or a creator spirit that is, that is also shining, showing us that, you know, we have um, uh, a spiritual presence in, um, in the nighttime. Um, anyways, we, breaking daylight. So this was, uh, this was another kind of aspect of my art side that, um, Surrealism, modernism, prim primitivism. Surrealism was the first thing, since I didn't go to art school, I started to look at books and I found it fascinating. You know, they, they had a regard for, um, you know, for Northwest Coast art, the surrealists did, and there's a lot of psychoanalysts, you know, uh, around the symbolism in surrealist painting, so I found that really fascinating. But this is basically an African sculpture and, and um, I think it's, uh, I forget, uh, uh, a, Russian, a Russian artist on the right. But so you have a lot of these, these, um, these uh, you know, in the era of modernism, <clears throat> there was a lot of looking at work from Native American, African art, uh, oceanic art. And so, you know, there was, it led to this genre called primitivism, which was looking at older, forms of art, and then bringing some of that meaning into the modern art. So this is a Brancusi, but then I started to sort of turn the tables on the modernists. This is like my little Brancusi fish. Um, this is Picasso and a, and a Haida mask from Alaska. Um, and so a lot of these things you, you start to wonder, like, you know, this, this issue of appropriation <clears throat> and of course it was from a natural uh, you know, appreciation of what they were seeing, but there's also like an unlearning of what they were, you know, what the modernists were trying to do. They were seeking something new, and so they were trying to deconstruct their way of thinking to be able to create something different. Um, and so I went on this whole sort of, uh, this is another side of what I do. I showed you the representational kind of stuff, but this is, these are pieces that are more uh, based on amulet forms and organics, you know, spare organic forms. But of course, they're, you know, they're um, ornamented with uh, Northwest Coast art. Um, and sometimes I try to get into the, the symbolism um, uh, and tell aspects of different stories or just sort of create, you know, something I give it a poetic name that it becomes, you know, people can read into it what they wish, but this to me, you know, represents the idea of a, a modernist piece of art, kind of this um, Henry Moore or a, uh, Isamu Noguchi. Um, and so a lot of this was just kind of playing, you know, with uh, new directions and trying to illustrate, you know, certain things um, you know, this is kind of like a, a raven sculpture, two-sided raven. Um, and then these are often inspired by shaman's amulets, which, you know, could be little fetishes that are carried with you or worn as a necklace, what have you. <coughs> so these are some of the newer pieces. And then really touching on the modernism thing, this is um, like Calder was the, the very well known for doing these um, mobiles and um, so a little bit about indigenous artist gatherings. I've traveled around quite a bit working with um, Maori and Hawaiian, um, Australian Ab Aboriginal. So here we are down in, in New Zealand with the Maori people, you know, incredible people. Of course, you know, the haka. So here's me doing the haka there, you know, looking very fierce. Um, and, uh, but the, uh, yeah, the Maori are just incredible people, really, really unified, really, really um, education, educated, progressive, and, and unified as, a, as a, um, in, uh, a people. And it's amazing to see what they are accomplishing down there. 
Sometimes we get to you know, blow glass and I can share my technique with them. Uh, but it's led to a lot of collaborations. This is Jody Naranjo, uh, Santa Clara Pueblo. Um, so each time when I collaborate with somebody, I usually let them uh, kind of take the lead in, in what the imagery is going to be. And so these potters, you know, it was, it was perfect because uh, coming from a glass blowing background, it, I was able to just have an easy time to make the form and then they have to uh, put the designs on it. So these are all done with the same technique of covering the piece with the rubber stencil and then cutting out the areas that are going to be sandblasted. Um, here I am in Australia. And then this uh, Aboriginal artist came up to work with me in the cold middle of December from the hottest, one of the hottest places on the earth. Um, these, this was you know, some of the work that they had done here. Again, um, Joe David was, of course, my mentor, as I, met, I told you. Uh, so we worked together um, doing a lot of this uh, kind of stuff um, and interpreting different uh, symbols around his artwork or his cultural art. Um, Lewis Gardner is a, a Maori jade carver, so these green elements are a jade stone. We conjoined our you know, cultural styles and put them both into the piece. <clears throat> to work with people like this. So Marcus is from Choctaw, and then there's Raven Sky River, who's also Clinkett, who's a really talented sculptor, uh, doing these naturalistic kinds of, um, you know, sea life. Um, so I get to put my design work on them, and we collaborate in that way. The killer whale, mother and uh, calf. Lisa Telford is a Haida weaver. Um, and then just kind of ending on the, 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 um, the music that I still do. This is a group called Kuik. It's, uh, uh, it is means potlatch in the Clinket language, actually. Um, oh, that was out of order. See, I just I had this, I have too much to, <laughs> have too much to share. This is a, just a little bit about um, some of the large scale castings that I'm doing. Um, this represented my great grandmother who had a pet grizzly bear as a child. Um, and um, it's about 2,000 pounds of glass. This I made uh, as a collaboration with some Sklalem carvers. Oh, it's a little bit of order here. This is actually in the bony courthouse. I thought I had a picture of that completed. Clearly, I have to look at my presentation again a little closer. Um, this was a latest piece we did for um, the uh, Climate Pledge Arena. Um, so you can see that piece outside of the arena. At the time, we didn't know that it was going to be the Kraken, and so we uh, was the the mascot for the team. So we were kind of it was fun to hear that. Well, actually, they probably knew, and that's why they chose that design because we had a raven as well. But they said, "No, the octopus is going to be just fine." <laughs> this is um, um, this is in a cultural art or. Um, uh, cultural Arts Center in Juneau, Alaska. So I got this piece back into the home community. This was an uh, interior of a little presentation uh, room. This looks very much like a clan house, like a tr traditional clan house. Um, no, but then there is the, back to the music. So these are all these group, this is all the music that I've, I've come up with. Um, our, collaborated with several different um, musicians. There's about 10, a 10 piece band that we worked together. And I was working with this fellow named Bernie Worrell, who was um, actually a famous person who passed away in 2016, but he was a keyboard player for Parliament Funkadelic and was pretty much the, the main music that a lot of the rap musicians were using in the 80s and 90s, Ice Cube and all these musicians sampled his sounds and they, um, but I, I was able, I met with him um, 
he played my 50th birthday party. This was a while ago. <laughs> and so we, he, he, he made an uh, offer to collaborate with me. So I got together with my, my um, Clinkit um, uh, friends and we were using traditional songs to kind of create this undertone of music with uh, or for. And so we, we actually, it resulted in four um, triple LPs. We, ac we actually make vinyl, uh, vinyl albums, but we're also on Spotify and all that stuff too. So these performances are quite fun. You know, they're, it's kind of like a three ring circus. You know, you get so many people on stage. Um, and the, this is Sandra, she's Haida. This Kachung is from, uh, uh, he's Yupik. And um, this is the newest member of our group, Air Jazz. He's Clinkit uh, and African American. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a lot of fun because it's, it's my sort of, another part of my artistic expression. Um, I have a little video, I think, I think we have time to just flip. If you, gotta, if you guys have to split, go right ahead. But, um, oh, you know, so we lost, we lost a couple members too um, over this time. Clarissa was a really skilled uh, chill cat weaver. She died in 2016, as well as Bernie died in 2016. Um, so we carry on with new members. Um, let's see if... From the new album, Boots! Boots! Hey, we're bringing a brother up here, a nephew! This is our nephew here! Ah, uh, here, Chaz! A khuni! A khat! For whom I speak, take it up a peek. If confidence is key, don't be confidential. Like I'm to compliment, so you got potential of going continental. With unity, you and me, using these communities. In which you peace, orbit in north with the form of revenge, proportionate to the force. Don't go over the edge.
like, oh, that's so sad, man. Rise up and do what you can. Hey! I'd be happy to address them. There's one over here. Uh, the, 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 the Raven exhibition? Yeah, I mean, the Raven, it started in Tacoma at the Museum of Glass, and then it went out east, and now it's um, the closest it might get back is towards the end of the run in maybe 2025. Uh, at, in Spokane, potentially. Um, we we're hoping it might get up to Vancouver, but you know, since it was in Tacoma, it probably wouldn't come to Seattle. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, at one point, the art form came to a very thin thread where there wasn't many people doing it, keeping it alive. Um, but then there was, uh, it sort of started coming back in the late 70s, 80s. Um, but there, yeah, there is such a distinction about Northwest Coast Native art because it really does have, like these elements are very recognizable. They're, they're, they're very distinctive. And it's been, there's always a lot of questions about it. Like, is it, they were, because it was so conservative as a culture that it didn't change, or it's so strong a tradition that it didn't change. I mean, it's, there's still something that I, stri I strive to make it look just like as as close as I can, even though it's not a traditional material of uh, of you know wood or what have you. Um, and so yeah, those those elements are very. There's a there's a real system of design that is that really makes it look like the very best pieces. You can see that they are really strong. You know you you know that. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of. Um, you know, there's a lot of chainsaw totem pole, you know, totem poles out there too. Um, but they, uh, yeah, there's something about it, and it's not easy to answer. All right. Well, yeah, I did show you a lot, so I don't, I'm not surprised there's no questions. <laughs> I like to share as much as I can. But uh, anyway, thanks so much for being, being here. Uh, appreciate it. Have a good rest of your Indigenous Peoples Day. <laughs>